Berkshire, in my work, grew their economic earning power by about $7 billion last year. Now, uh, the stock was up 4%. Book value and book value per share were down. They bought back 1.2% of the stock. But it was a it was a year of capital allocation. I mean, the 92-year-old that sits there in Omaha is still at the top of his game. Widely criticized for maybe overstaying his welcome. You've got kooks that think that we ought to separate the chairman role from the CEO role, which they're going to do when he's gone. But, you know, the voting control rests with Mr. Buffett. Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and I'm here with Chris Broomstrand. Chris, how are you today? Dick, I'm great. I'm great. It's good to be doing this again this year with you and look forward to being in Omaha with you. Yeah, well, well said, Chris. Uh, we're recording this April 18th, and this this episode will be published on April 29th, or the weekend before the Berkshire weekend. If, well, at least that's what we would call it, I guess. If you're running the same circles as as Chris and me, uh, and today's episode will be all about Berkshire. And Chris, I think you've attended the meeting since 2000. Is that right? Yeah, we bought the stock for the first time in February 2000, after it had been cut in half post the Genry deal. And when nobody wanted to own a real business, they were infatuated with the internet and all things tech and Berkshire was out of fashion. So it traded at about 105% of what was a fairly conservatively stated book value. So yeah, Chad and I went to the meeting that year um, and missed, in fact, um, missed the next year, 2001, because my daughter was born today, by the way, Lucy, it's her 22nd birthday. If you can believe how fast time flies, that first meeting in Omaha at the old downtown arena it wow. feels like it was yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and Chris, you you uh, we we had a chance to talk a bit here before we uh, we hit record, and uh, we talked about um, like the good old days, for lack of better words. And you know, uh, I, I read somewhere that Buffett used to like. Uh, shake the hands of everyone who came in uh, from abroad, like back back in the day. And you actually had a story from, from what, was it your first meeting that you had the story from? Yeah, so so we buy the stock. And I, I followed the company since they issued the B shares in 96, and it finally got cheap enough to buy. In any event, headed to Omaha and with my business partner, Chad. And, you know, you did dinner the night before and ran into some folks that that we knew and uh, it was a small gathering. I mean, you know, the MBA, the 20 something crowd really haven't gravitated to Berkshire at that point. It probably had 11 or 12,000 at the meeting that year. So it, you know, it had caught on, but it was nowhere near the cult that it is today. You had a lot of the original shareholders, um, folks that had owned the stock for a long time, the golden burgers in any event. So you, you still had to get there early enough if you wanted to get a good seat. So you queue up early. And, you know, you had the line. It was, I, I think they had one door that went into the old arena in downtown Omaha. It had not moved over to the new convention center yet. And so you've got this line and all these festivities outside. They had just bought uh, Acme Brick. And so with Justin Boots, there were a couple of the, the CEO and maybe the CFO were riding the Longhorn down the street. But it started raining and drizzling. It was, it was cold as hell. And so uh, Berkshire, they opened the doors early. And I mean, this literally was like the Who concert in Cincinnati where everybody got trampled. All these blue hairs, gray hairs broke rank. They broke line, scrambled to the door. It was a mad rush. And there at the front door stands Warren uh, trying to shake everybody's hand. But, you know, everybody's trying to go get their choice real estate. So they blow past him. And these people are scrambling with their walkers and canes and what a million miles an hour. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And it was, it was at that moment I realized, good Lord, we've actually joined a cult. <laughs> what, what an amazing, amazing story, Chris. Um, and I, I can't help but, but ask, uh, when, uh, when are you going to, to, to be in line this year? Have you, have you decided yet? I don't know. I, I've been lucky to have some, some younger friends that are more spry that have done the early morning, you know, we tend to get there pretty early. Um, you know, my body's breaking down. I've got to have joints replaced this year. And so I've got to get a seat that has some leg room in the aisle. And you know, I've had folks that have saved those seats for a few years. So, well, so we'll be there plenty early. I mean, the sun 
the sun will likely not be up. And I've got a, some bunch of friends and clients coming this year for the first time. So you want to make sure you get a good seat for the meeting. If you haven't been, you know, it, it might sound a bit odd that Chris and I would have this this conversation like, oh, what time are you going to like queue up? But it, it is a thing. <laughs> you know, you sort of like you sort of like have to experience it. It's, it's like, yeah, you know, to use Warren's words, like the, the Woodstock of capitalism, right? You Some people camp out. You, you know, they want they want the good seat. And and I'm almost embarrassed to say I, w- I was telling Chris here just before we uh, we started the recording that. I just I I can't do the 4:30 anymore. Like I I used to do that, and and now I'm just like no, I can't because I'm plowing through the entire day with with my schedule there, and you know I, I I die out there around like 8 p.m. if I if I if I start my day at at 4:30. So kudos kudos to you, uh, Chris, for for starting early. Uh, that's well, can, uh, that's pretty cool. Upgrade you can upgrade the wine selection for some of the younger folks in your in your circle, and you know ply them with with good food and beverage and maybe talk them into getting up and running ahead. <laughs> That's, that sounds like a good investment, Chris. I'll, I'll uh, keep that in, keep that in mind. So, um, Chris, I, I wanted to jump into, to the outline here of, of today's conversation. And I want to start out by saying that, you know, they say it's easier to fall in love than to stay in love, but I don't think that's true for Berkshire. Like you and so many of our listeners, you know, I've read, multiple books about Buffett and Munger and Berkshire Hathaway. And you know, we, we make this annual pilgrimage to Omaha uh, that we, we just talked about uh, just now. And, you know, a part of me feels that I might be susceptible to the liking bias. And this is something that, that Munger talked about in his famous speech, uh, The Psychology of Human Adjustment. Um, I, I don't know if that's something that you considered also, Chris, because I know you read a lot of information coming out from Berkshire, but how do we as investors stay objective to the new information that comes out from the company and whenever we read their SEC filings and, and so on? You know, Stig, I think Berkshire is one of the few, maybe Costco, a small handful of others, where it's really is safe to drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, we talked about it being a cult, but you've got 58 years of history with Mr. Buffett running this thing and, and the trust is verified. It's like the old Reagan uh, line when he met with Gorbachev, uh, trust but verify, actually borrowed the phrase from, from a Russian proverb. In any event, you look at the history of how the business has been operated, how the management is compensated. The insiders have never paid themselves a restricted share or a stock option. You know, the myriad amalgamation of companies that make up the public stock market um, with just a plethora of write-offs and write-downs and abusive accounting and cultures of trying to massage Wall Street to ensure you make the quarterly number. Berkshire's never done any of that. Um, You've got the finest collection of insurance companies on the planet and 56 years of owning national indemnity and then all of the successive insurers that they acquired. Geico and Genry, now Allegheny's collection of three insurance companies, all the little primary businesses, their specialty businesses. You don't run an operation uh, in the insurance world to make the quarter. Um, You look at the reserve development tables they're just very conservative about the approach. They really do when they say they walk away from business when it's mispriced. They do um, reinsurance pricing has firmed in the last couple of years. They're writing a lot more business. They're actually writing more cat business today. But you don't see the big one-off losses. You don't see them having to go to the capital markets to re-strengthen the insurance book. And for the conservatism, surplus capital has grown. Um, so I, I, I think... It really is. It really is a place where trust is verified. Mr. Buffett wrote about it in the annual meeting this year. He said we've got these, bill, you know, this bill, a lot, a lot of billionaires and centi millionaires who've owned the stock for years. And he said none of them go as far as to read the MDNA, or they don't read the footnotes. They don't have to because they trust what Warren of Charlie have done for so many years. Now, you know, they're getting to the end, which is a shame for all of us, but. You'll have to watch the business and analysts. You know, we I you know I spend a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time over the years um, trusting but verifying 
Um, there are moving parts that we watch. I've watched the progression of the manufacturing service retail businesses weaken over a period of time, perhaps a decade and a half. And I think that was a cultural thing. I think that was selling a business to Berkshire and simply sending the profits to Omaha and not thinking about reinvestment opportunities, not necessarily thinking about strengthening the bench. Greg's been involved now for a few years there. He's gotten his arms around all those subsidiaries. But you know, when Warren's gone, you've got to watch Greg and then you've got to watch whoever replaces Greg. And if you see a business that starts talking to the street and they start providing guidance, which most businesses do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, if you see the culture shift to one of more of a shorter term orientation, particularly when you're running an insurance operation, you know, you, you know, I think you'll have plenty of, I think you'll have plenty of red flags in advance that the culture might be shifting, but at, at this point you can't, you can't kill it. They're massively overcapitalized in insurance. There are only a few big moving parts that really matter. Uh, the railroad, the utility operations, and the insurance operation make up three quarters the value of the business. You can get into the nuance of the MSR businesses, but they're very diversified, very disparate. They're unlevered, which is a margin of safety on a net basis. The, the MSR group doesn't carry net debt with the exception of you know carrying some debt with leasing operations, which is offset by assets. It's, it really is the variable for Knox. And the trust is deserved and, and the culture will persist for a long time. And so I think it's, uh, you know, you know it, 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 it's, a, it's about as worthy of parking money and, and putting it in the top drawer and never having to worry about it as most businesses that you can find globally. That's, uh, that's beautiful, is said. Um, and, and I wanted to continue talking a bit about love if we can and, and stay in that theme. You know, my, my co-founder Preston and I, we have this ongoing joke that we are lucky to be married because it's very hard to find a woman who can tolerate how much we're in love with accounting. And I wanted to share that love uh, with the listener and offer a perspective on, on the book value of Berkshire that is often used as a shortcut for valuation. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, but investors should be aware of what the price to book tells us and, and also what it doesn't tell us. And you have this, uh, this highlight uh, in, your, in your wonderful letter that I uh, should give a huge shout out to. Uh, and everyone can find it for, for free on, on your website. Um, but if you go to page 76, you, you talk about Berkshire's equity portfolio, which has declined 16% in 2022. And this highlights the potential flaws of using price to book as a yardstick for valuation, especially coupled with earnings power growth. Um, could you, Chris, perhaps paint some color around the performance of the equity portfolio and how that can change the gap between book value and intrinsic value? Well, that's always been the case in accounting when a public company owns shares of a company uh, as an investment, any unrealized capital gains are offset with a deferred tax liability. So as the portfolio grows, recently we changed the marginal tax rate to 21% from 35% in the United States. And so now you only capture 79% of the upside in terms of any gains that are accreted to book value. And then conversely, there's an offset when a portfolio declines. And so you have that nuance, but think about it. In 2022, you had a 300 and let's say $50 billion portfolio going into the year, declines by 15 or so percent. Um, book value is declining by that 15% offset by the tax shield of the tax rate. Um, stock price was up about 4% last year. So price rises, the book value of Berkshire drops. And so you've got a higher price to book at the end of the year. But with any investment, do you want a lower price or a higher price? And so to my mind, you know, everybody wants to run around and, and quote to the minute what the price to book is, but nobody really looks through to say, is this a better book value or a worse book value? And so the cheaper the stock portfolio gets, the more attractive it is, which equates to simply higher prospective returns. And so that portfolio dropped from 19 and change times earnings going into 2022 to under 14 times last year. And the decline in the overall stock market allowed Berkshire to spend a whole bunch of money. I mean, they spent a net $50 billion buying more shares. So the portfolio ended the year at just under $310 billion down from 350, but they spent $50 billion. So you had a big loss and book value declined, but 
it, it, it was a, it was a more wholesome book. I mean, I had a offset in the portfolio the prior year. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at a, when you look at a company that owns a portfolio of common stocks, it's almost like valuing a cyclical business. Um, you try to figure out what the median kind of, kind of mid mid cycle earning power is, you know, so you're trying to figure out what the portfolio is worth. And there have been times in the past where the Berkshire portfolio has been really, really inexpensive. There have been times where the portfolio has been really, really expensive. Go back to when we bought our shares, uh, two years prior, uh, Berkshire's share price had been rewarded for the first period from, you know, 1965 to 1998. Uh, where the stock had compounded at mid twenties, and the stock portfolio itself had compounded at a faster rate, or compounded at a higher rate, uh, you know, augmented by the leverage that you had from insurance. The stock portfolio was larger than book value. Ber- Berkshire was really an insurance operation until they diversified into Mid American Energy and then the certain successive energy operations, and also then into the railroad in two thousand and ten. It was very driven by insurance. You look at the value of marketable securities versus the operating earnings of the franchise, and it really tilted towards insurance. And in insurance, you tend to carry more investment assets than you have shareholder equity. And so in Berkshire's case, as all these years passed of conservative underwriting, not having to, to, to build reserves because you've, you've, you've misstated uh, losses and you've been too aggressive, surplus capital build. You had a whole bunch of years. You had 25 years, let's say, where, there, where the stock portfolio itself as a percentage of insurance reserves and invested assets was larger than shareholders' equity. And so that grew to where the stock portfolio was trading very expensively. Coca-Cola was trading at almost 50 times earnings, and it was, it was 35% of the stock portfolio in 1998. Berkshire had a high-class problem of the stock portfolio having done so well, but also Berkshire shares itself having done so well that it traded at three times book. Well, that was a bad book value. I mean, Berkshire's stock portfolio was worth less. Berkshire itself was worth less. And so you really needed to mark both of those down. Berkshire wasn't worth at that point much more than 150% of book value. They remedied some of that with their purchase of Genry, and I won't get into the nuances there, but you know they've spent the stock at almost three times book as currency entirely in a deal. Uh, to pay $22 billion for Gen Re when the stock itself was only worth $11 billion and wound up ultimately Gen Re bringing 45% of the assets to that combined merger where the shareholder of Gen Re only got 18% of the combined business. And so Berkshire bought a big bond portfolio, essentially diversified without paying capital gains taxes and selling Coca-Cola, diversified the stock portfolio by buying a giant bond portfolio essentially and tripling its float it was just a it was just a genius transaction and so you know warren knew that the book value was 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 not as wholesome it was not a cheap book value it was an expensive book value and the price that shareholders were paying at that moment was an expensive price similarly i think over the course of 2022 berkshire's book value became more valuable even though the book value itself per share declined and so You've got to think through what are the underlying assets worth. Essentially, is kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, that's uh, that's well said. And and you had this beautiful write up in one of your letters. I want to say it was the 2021, but I I, I could be off. Uh, when you talk about Jen Reed, that was uh, absolutely uh, masterful the way uh, that was uh, outlined. So I'm going to make sure to link to that in the show notes. Uh, not to to be taken away from uh, from that maneuver. Um, but in, in your more recent letter, um, it's called Profit Less Prosperity, Investing in Inflation. Uh, investing Inflation, I should say, and Berkshire getting better all the time. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to be referencing uh, that letter a, a few times here during the outline. And again, I'm, I'll make sure to, to link to that in the show notes. I think it's well worth a read. And especially if you're going to Omaha, you know, um, you might sit with people like Chris and me who just can't get enough of accounting. <laughs> and And so... But in your in your letter, you you mentioned that maintenance capex roughly matches depreciation expenses, and this is a relationship that has held over time. And understanding maintenance capex is an important concept in valuation, and something I would like to dig a bit deeper into together with you. Is this characteristic for Berkshire Hathaway in particular that maintenance capex roughly match the depreciation expense? Um, I think that's 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 part of it. And then the other part would be perhaps you could 
use the example of uh, BHE and BNSF to provide an example of growth and maintenance uh, capex. Yeah, it's an important nuance across the industrial economy, in particular, the capital intensive economy. I think that's generally a fair way to look at um, the relationship between depreciation. I mean, an asset, a 40 year asset has to be replaced. If you, if you have a house, you're going to have to, you're going to have to replace the roof every 20 years. And so if you're buying a used home, you need to assess deferred maintenance and the, the, the price that you're paying relative to the cost of replacing that portion of the asset base. And so depreciation is an easy expense. There were uh, for a long time, forever, you would, you would write up, you would write off depreciation. Um, and the analysts had to add back the depreciation charge, much like today, a goodly portion of other intangibles are written down and some portion really do decay. Some portion don't decay. And it's the job of the analyst to figure out what the real economic decay is. Well, depreciation is a real charge, even though it's a non-cash charge, if you've got to replace an asset. And so the depreciation number sits there in the, um, it sits there in the financials. You can read about it in the footnotes, uh, your depreciation schedules. Um, but very few companies tell you what maintenance cap it, CapEx is. And there are places where maintenance CapEx can be a lower number than the depreciation charge. We own Olin, for example, and I think maintenance CapEx there is probably 220 million. Depreciation is probably 600 million, but they're not going to add any capacity. There's no, there's zero growth CapEx. These have been incredibly well-maintained assets. And there's a little bit of hidden earning power there for the analysts that can figure that out. In Berkshire's case, I think the depreciation charge across all of its subsidiaries has been a pretty fair proxy for maintenance capex. And then you, to your point, you kind of look at what they've done with their two big seminal diversifications away from insurance into energy and into rail. Well, when they bought the railroad, Berkshire figured out that the economics of the industry were changing. Uh, the industry was going to start, and I'm talking class one rails now in North America, you were going to start earning more of a return on capital, less of a regulated return. So the economics were better. And so Berkshire figured out in the case of BNSF that even though you've had 36,000 track miles from the point at which they bought it to today, there were a lot of places where they could spend a bunch of money north of what you'd call maintenance CapEx or the depreciation charge. And in railroads, actually, Maintenance CapEx is typically a slightly higher number than depreciation, simply, I think, because some of the assets are so old, replacement cost of those assets is, is a higher number. You've got you know, 60-year-old assets that have to be replaced, and depreciation schedules may not have been correct over those assets. They've been fully depreciated for a long time, but in Berkshire's case, they realized with intermodal, the double stacking of containers that in their footprint in the West, if you were to expand corridors into the big port city. So going into LA, they were able to widen from four track wide to eight track wide to 12 track wide. You were able to blow out tunnels to accommodate the double stack of containers where you know, tunnel size wouldn't have fit. So there was a, there were a lot of what I would look at as growthy uh, capacity improvements that would allow more throughput into the system that I would categorize really in the growth uh, bucket where you're going to get an ac economic return on being able to ship more ton miles of freight because you've built a better system, even though you didn't necessarily expand track miles in your footprint. Now, a lot of that's run its course. And so in the early years, I mean, if you take BNSF, since Berkshire's owned it in 2010, they've spent almost $50 billion in CapEx, depreciation charges are 25. So they've kind of spent it two to one. But if you look at the current cadence of spending, of, of CapEx spending relative depreciation, you're really running closer to 130 or 140%. So a lot of that, that capacity improvement to the system has run its course. And in, their, in the case of the railroad, um, the, almost all of the profits that the railroad has made since Berkshire bought it for whatever it was, 36 or $37 billion, including the piece that they already owned, almost all of the profits have been dividended up to the parent company and they simply finance the cash flow with debt and cash on hand. And, and that was sufficient to finance the, the CapEx that was needed. In the utility operation, when they bought MidAmerican in 2006, 
I mean, they've spent way more than two dollars in capex cumulatively for every dollar of depreciation. Cumulatively, you've spent over eighty billion dollars depreciation charges are less than forty. For the majority of this this uh, period of time that they've you know they now own three utilities, they're building all this wind capacity and solar capacity, the grid that has to go with it. They're getting a regulated return on a lot of that asset you're building you're building out the rate base at a high single digit low double digit return in this case uh zero dollars of profits earned by the utilities and by the pipelines the various distribution assets zero dollars have been paid to berkshire as a dividend all of that capital has been reinvested and they have found places to economically on a tax subsidized basis in many cases but they found a place to put an enormous amount of money to work. I mean, last year, CapEx at, at BHE ran over $7 billion. The depreciation charge was about three and a half or $4 billion. Spending an enormous sum of money building out capacity. They're closing coal-fired capacity, but building wind-fired capacity and getting a regulated return on those numbers. And so there, there's a place where you know Berkshire can spend three or four billion dollars let, let's call it four billion dollars of the earnings that are that benefit itself uh berkshire doesn't own all of the energy operation they own 92 percent of it and then if you look under the hood at bhe itself they've got a number of joint ventures they bought some dominion assets that berkshire doesn't fully control 100 percent of the the lng export terminal they don't own 100 percent of there are a number of joint venture subsidiaries inside of BHE that aren't fully owned. So that, that the aggregate of that business really earns $5 billion and all of that is retained. And if you understand uh, accounting for utilities and regulated energy assets, if you understand the regulation of those assets, the regulators like to see you spend about half debt capital and half equity capital in the capital structure. So if Berkshire is going to retain four or $5 billion, they're going to augment that four or $5 billion with a like amount of debt. And that's now financing all of that growth CapEx. And so you've got a utility operation. You saw valued at 800 or you know, at, at, at $87 billion uh, a year ago when, when Greg's piece got bought out, he owned 1% of the company and that really matched what my appraisal was of the business. But if you look at a business that's going to retain $5 billion a year and earn 10% on that retained earnings plus the ongoing earnings on the capital base, this, this energy operation is going to be worth more than the railroad in two or three years because here's a home for an enormous amount of capital spending that really is growth CapEx. They're improving the system. They're improving the gigawatt. They're, they're increasing the gigawatt hours of capacity that the utilities can 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 sell into the marketplace and so it's a it's a wonderful home and there's i think it's a it's a perfect example of the nuance between what i would call growth capex versus maintenance capex could you paint some color around whenever you're talking about regulated returns is that is that different projects that the government um sort of like puts out there for for different companies to bid on or is it specifically do they do they Call Berkshire. Like, how does that process work? And and do they already know? It sounds like you already know it's going to be nine percent of this project or eleven percent of the other project. Like, how does that work in practice? Well, in, in electric utilities, they're they're largely monopolies, uh, granted permission to operate by the various state regulatory commissions, uh, overseen nationally by FERC, but. Nobody would spend money. You, you wouldn't build a nuclear plant. You wouldn't build uh, a, a wind farm unless you knew you were going to be allowed to make a return. Because if you've got a regulator that sets your price, essentially, essentially to get price, you've got to file a rate case with your regulator, and they then allow you a return based on the equity capital of the business. And so to incentivize somebody to go out and build power to sell on a price cap basis, you've got to allow that monopoly uh, an acceptable economic return. There have been a lot of cases where regulators change their mind. Uh, you look at somebody like Scana, there have been you know, stranded, uh, stranded nuclear plants where you spend a whole bunch of money and then you wound up not turning on the plant and the, the rate makers don't let you recover. But if you've got good relationships with your regulators, 
you kind of know what the return is. And, and that return is going to change based on interest rates, based on capital cost of replacement. And so the regulators understand, you know, kind of how much an equity return is going to be allowed. And now those numbers have come down as interest rates have come down over the last 20 years. It used to be earned kind of mid to low double digit returns on allowed equity. And those numbers nationally are closer to eight to nine to 10 percent today. Um, in Berkshire's world across their entire spectrum of energy assets. Some are non-regulated, some are regulated, some are sort of pseudo-regulated. They, they, the group really does earn about 10 to 11% on regulated, but a portion of that's very knowable. But you've got to be fair to your customers. Um, you know, regulators will crack down if they think you're overcharging, if they think you're underspending. Kind of that to that point about debt and equity, they don't like to see you underspent because... And you still run the, the, these are, even though they're monopolies, they're publicly traded. They're in many cases, they're publicly traded. They're for profit. They're sending a whole bunch of dividends to their shareholders. And you've got an obligation if you're the board of directors and you're the management to make money. I mean, you're in the business to make money, but you're, you're allowed to make money on a regulated basis. And so it's really easy kind of back to this notion of running a business for short term. It's very easy for a period of time to underspend on your assets and these assets have to be maintained. Um, plants have to be done, they, you know, they have to turn around. They've, they've got to because they've got to be repaired. Um, and so the, it, it's been, and you've seen myriad cases over the years of, uh, companies underspending on maintenance and a lot, it's no different than being a homeowner. You know, how much should you spend per year to maintain your house? Well, if you buy an old home and nobody's maintained it, you'll, you have a lot of surprises on where the deferred maintenance was. Same thing in the utility world. So they think if you're spending only, if your cap structure is only 40% debt, uh, the conventional wisdom is you're kind of underspending on maintenance capex. You're, you're, and if you're running kind of 60% debt, they think you've kind of gone wild and you've, you've, lost your mind on leverage and you're, you're overbuilding and you're trying to overbuild kind of your rate base. The happy medium is, um, you know, well-run utility uh, has terrific relations with their regulators. And in Berkshire's case, with their three big utilities, MidAmerican, Pacificorp, and Nevada Power, you've actually got a fourth there with Pacificorp. They own two utilities. But, you know, they're in growing markets and they've got good relations. And, and those three regulated businesses earn got a nine and a half to 10 on regulated equity. And then you throw in the rest of the d- distribution assets and that pulls the returns up a little bit north of 10%. But it's it's a very knowable return. It, monopolistic businesses, if you were if you run them well and properly, you'll, you'll be allowed an economic return. And as Berkshire's building all this wind and solar capacity, they're increasing the rate base on which they're allowed to make a regulated return. And so in a very knowable fashion, you've got a very good use of Berkshire's capital, at least that portion of profit that's earned by that energy business that is retained. And it's going to grow the rate base and it's going to grow the shareholders' equity of that business by uh, about 10% a year, to where it will be the second largest piece of Berkshire, larger than the railroad here within two or three years. Uh, it'd be years before they pass the insurance operation in scope. I mean, that's insurance operations worth way more than, well, it's worth probably, uh, it's probably worth, well, the insurance operations worth <laughs> probably twice as much. It's probably worth about as much as the uh, energy business and the railroad combined, I would say. What's stopping that from, from growing? Is that because it has to grow in, internally? Is that, is that just the size of the market? Is it because of regulation that, that they're not arbitrary number or, doubling down 50% whatnot on, on that unit. You're, you're, I mean, you, they're only going to go build and uh, projects they have the capital for. I mean, they've got an insatiable appetite. They've talked about spending 18 to $20 billion simply building out the grid in the West over a period of, let's say 10 years. Um, if they could invest in more of those projects, they would, they're competitive. Uh, but Berkshire has the capability to do a lot of things that others couldn't do. I think if they, I think if they could could bid on more, they would. They tried to bid on some backup natural gas distribution, uh, really reserve power uh, in the Texas grid, which is fairly unregulated. The ERCOT grid is a little bit differently regulated. There's a lot of there's a lot more wildcatting for power in Texas. Um, 
not so much a, a single monopoly, but more competition, certainly into the industrial market. And you had the freeze and you had uh, the real issues three or four, I guess it was three years ago. Uh, Berkshire bid on some assets there. They didn't get them. So, you know, permitting, it just takes a long time to get a lot of this stuff done. You've, you've got to work with regulators. You've got to demonstrate you've got the skill set to be able to do what they're doing. And I think if they could do more, they would. And I think they're, I think part of the mission there is to continue to find places to invest. And that's why they were able to buy some of these assets. And some of these energy assets are perceived to be dirty. I mean, pipelines are a dirty asset in the ESG world. And so I think for that, they had the opportunity to buy the assets from Dominion a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think you'll see Berkshire make more acquisitions on that front as the political landscape steers us more toward renewables. And you've got various players that simply are going to bow to the political pressures and the climate pressures. You know, Berkshire itself has a lot of pressure to not underwrite energy um, classical energy. And you see that in the proxy this year. Um, but they have an appetite to spend money and, and a demonstrated ability to generate returns and, and to take care of their customers and work well with the regulators. And that reputation that Berkshire has developed over all the years with their energy operations will serve it very well over the coming decades. If you enjoy this podcast, you are going to love our free investing newsletter called We Study Markets. We've realized that not everyone has time to listen to a podcast every day or even every week. So we took this same type of content and put it into an easy to read newsletter. In just five minutes a day, you can stay up to date with what's going on in the financial world and what's happening with your money. And it's completely free. Join over 30,000 other readers now by simply clicking the link here on the pop-up on your screen and then entering your email. It's that simple. Just click the link here in the pop-up on your screen, enter your email, and start knowing what's happening with your money. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris, for, for shining a light on that. Uh, I should also mention that The Economist just had a wonderful series on investing in, in electric grids, which, at least if you're so inclined, is actually quite interesting. Um, so it's, it's also very interesting to hear like the U S perspective, which is regulated very differently than, than in Europe where believe it or not, it's, it's way more messy. Uh, <laughs> so if you're, if you're so inclined, it's definitely uh, worth the read going back to, uh, to Berkshire's equity portfolio that we already talked a bit about, um, here before in 2022, we saw the PE go from 19.1 X to 13.6, and that would equate to a 7.3 uh, earnings yield that could produce, you know, um, high single digit, low double digit returns if you include multiple expansion, ongoing growth and earnings power. Um, in your last letter for 2021, uh, you estimated 50 billion in overvaluation of the stock portfolio, lastly attributed to Apple. Now, Apple Inc. produced a 26.4% loss in 2022, wiping out that discount ish, and the stock portfolio is at least fairly valued uh, today. Now, you also mentioned that 73% of the equity portfolio is Apple, Bank of America, Chevron, uh, Coca-Cola, American Express. Um, so we probably need to have a better look at those stocks before we can make an informed opinion about the future returns of the portfolio. And I also should say that you actually, you actually say there in your letter that you don't know if the stocks are individually or collectively expensive, but then you, you also you know, comment on a few other stocks. And I would say that perhaps your statement is a bit humble. At least that's, that's what I would say if I would put you on the, uh, on the spot. Um, so I don't know, Chris, if I could ask you to share some perspective on some of the individual stocks that uh, the Buffett owns uh, or Berkshire owns uh, and what we should look out for as investors. Well, to your point, the concentration has always been in, in a handful of companies. It was Coca-Cola in 1998. And, you know, from the point Warren bought Coke right after the stock market crash in 87 over a period of a couple, three years, they got 1.3 billion in it. It grew to $13 billion. Well, today, um, that position at Berkshire's, um, uh, hasn't done much. It's grown kind of mid single digit, but you had to grow from a 50 multiple to earnings down to a 25 multiple earnings. So over the last decade or two and a half decades, the multiple has been cut in half offset by still, you know, decent unit growth. And they've got enormous pricing power. You had the inflation last year 
Coke's got the ability to pass through their syrup. I mean, it's a, immediate top line growth. They control distribution. And so they're going to grow their profitability in line with top line growth. There are a lot of manufacturers that got, got massively squeezed last year. You could, you could, you could grow your sales, but you, you took massive hits in margin. Kind of like Coke was in 98, Apple's now the 800 pound gorilla in the portfolio, uh, running between 40 and 50% of the stock portfolio. Yeah, a, a year ago, at the end of 2021, the big tech companies had done so well. I had a section in my letter that talked about the big five, Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Google and Facebook um, had compounded at something like 38% a year for the prior decade. They were trading collectively at 35 times earnings. Apple, which Berkshire bought, and spent mid thirty billions of dollars. I think their basis in what's left. He trimmed it. Mr. Buffett trimmed some shares a couple of years ago, but they've still got a thirty one or thirty two billion dollar basis. Well, a year ago, at the end of twenty one, at north of thirty times earnings, that position in Berkshire was over one hundred and sixty billion dollars. And I thought that piece alone was overvalued. And I think if you think about Apple being a great consumer company. Uh, they've got to reinvent their product line, but it's very sticky. You know, I'm out in the Apple architecture. I'm not going to not have an Apple phone. I'm not going to have an iPad. I'm not going to have the Mac uh, notebook. Everything's integrated on the desktop everywhere I am, office, office at the house, the the notebook. I'm not leaving that. I'm not leaving that architecture. That makes it sticky. But you're going to do $400 billion in sales and almost a 25% profit margin. So Apple's almost doing $100 billion in profit. And the stock's recovered. I mean, it was up, I think, 31% for the first quarter and is still up 27 or 28% as we speak. Berkshire's overall stock portfolio was up 10 or 11%, I would guess, for the first quarter. We'll see exactly what it was. You know, some of these positions are, don't exist in the 13F and we've tried to reconcile all that, but I'd say the stock portfolio was up about 11%. All of that gain was Apple. Uh, you know, Apple's back to 150 plus billion dollar position. It's back to 25 times earnings and it's just not going to grow as fast. Uh, Apple can't grow as fast for the next 15 years as it's grown for the last 15 years because they're doing $400 billion on the top line. So I would presume you, perhaps you hold margins kind of constant where they are. You're going to get a mid to high, I think probably high single digit growth in, in dollar sales. You're going to get maybe 10% out of it when you account for all the sherry purchases that are ongoing at Apple. And in the last 15 years, they've retired something like 40% of the outstanding shares. They don't seem to be as price sensitive as you would like, but the majority of these last de of the last decade, the stock was cheap. I mean, Berkshire paid 12 or 13 times earnings for Apple and a huge part of that gained from 35 billion or 31 billion or whatever up to $160 billion. Today's 150 billion is multiple expansion, but it's also an enormous amount of growth. So you've still got more growth out of Apple than you're going to get out of most companies, but the growth rate can't be as fast. And so if you wind up growing dollar sales at five or 6%, when the world catches on that growth is not uh, going to be at a rate at which it had been historically, it's probably not worth 25 or 30 times. And if you hold margins constant, and I could see Apple at 20 times, I could see Apple back at 15 times earnings. And so you drop it from 25 to 15, you're 40% down on the multiple offset by whatever the growth is in the business. And so Apple's back to where I would discount it in terms of its overall valuation and its back to pushing. If it's $150 billion, the stock portfolio was $309 billion going into the year, up about 10%. So you're going to be uh, 300, uh, probably $40 billion. Uh, I think Warren said in the, I read the transcript the other night, uh, I did not see the CNBC interview with Becky, but I think he said he bought $4 billion worth of stock in the quarter. And so you're probably going to be about 300 and uh, $345 billion will be the stock portfolio. So it's just about going to be back to the size at which it was at the end of 2021. But they've spent $51 billion net last year and maybe another $4 billion in the first quarter. The other, so the other four bigs, Coke and Bank of America, American Express, and Chevron now, I mean, collectively, they're all about the same size. If you add them up, 
either they're they're not as big as the Apple position. And again, Apple's the 800 pound gorilla. Those others are all 25 to $30 billion positions. Um, Coke's not going to grow as it had. I wouldn't pay 25 times for Coke. Uh, you essentially are going to get a mid single digit, maybe a six or 7% out of it, but it's conservative six or seven. I mean, the, the diversity of its brand portfolio in global reach and distribution, you still have international growth. Um, it just, it's not going to do what, it's not going to do what it did for Berkshire in its first decade of ownership. Um, and then you've got the two banks, Bank of America and American Express. I I could not tell you how to value a, a big money center bank. You know, the liability side of the balance sheet is knowable. The asset side of banks is never knowable. And you see that today. Um, uh, you've got a diversified stream of uh, in, investment banking and you know, kind of non-fee revenue which offsets some of the volatility of the bank side. But I've always thought you just buy banks after a banking crisis when they're all trading at half a book and the good ones have been recapitalized. Uh, Berkshire probably regrets, they tr- they trimmed down the bank portfolio. I think, yeah, I think Mr. Buffett understood you had asset liability mismatches. And when you're starting it, it at the zero bound on interest rates, you can see banks that get a little aggressive with their, investment portfolios and put a bunch of mortgages on the books. Well, they're all learning about duration and convexity risk today. Uh, Bank of America will be fine because they're too big to fail. Um, depositors will be covered. Uh, but you'll see some, I think you've got ongoing bank troubles. Anytime the Fed goes from zero to 500 basis points on the short end of the curve, banks are levered at 10 to one. That's how fractional reserve banking works. Um, and you're going to get asset liability, liability mismatches. You haven't seen credit problems yet, but if the economy devolves to where we're in a deep recession, you're going to augment this interest rate problem that you have, this duration mismatch that you have with some banks with the credit book on portfolios. And that's where you can really get into trouble. So I think we're in the early innings of banks, but the stock's down a bunch. I mean, probably down 40% from its peak. And so having sold off all of Wells Fargo, which he Berkshire had owned for years, when they massively got rid of Goldman, they sold off, even trimmed down U.S. Bank, which they still own. But uh, PNC is gone, M&T is gone. All those banks they had, that bank concentration in the portfolio was fairly high. And going into this problem, I think they saw what was coming in the banking world. I wouldn't want to own banks it broadly, and so they trimmed it down. So they still sit with the Bank of America, which is now, you know, trading at ten to earnings. They took a big reserve uh, development two years ago, uh, almost $7 billion. Probably not if you're going to have a recession properly reserved. So I'd, I'd, I'd tread carefully with the banks. Then we own American Express. It's a really good business. They're still impacted by, we still haven't fully recovered the business travel, international business travel, but it's a hell of a, it's just a heck of a business. And you know, at 15 to earnings, it's probably fairly valued, um, not cheap. So I, I, again, I don't know, um, but, you know, that collection of five is really, if you want to monitor the stock portfolio, kind of all you need to know. But I don't think you're going to get any wonderful returns out of the stocks going forward. You know, probably at best match the S&P 500, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But tell me what Apple is going to do if Apple's still trading at 25 or 30 times earnings a decade from now you'll have a pretty good experience. Uh, if Apple trades at 15 times earnings, you know, the, the overall S&P 500 is expensive and probably more expensive than the Berkshire portfolio would be. Going into this year, the Berkshire portfolio was probably cheap and that was Apple having traded down to 20 times earnings. But long answer, I'm, it's Apple, 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 but it's it's <laughs> it's almost half of the damn stock portfolio. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's uh, that's a good point that, that you... Uh... Uh, that you make also because uh, I think the listeners should also know that some of the numbers that we refer to here that end of, end of 2022, but we're also sitting here in April, and you know there have been some changes, and so you sort of like have to have to separate the two. Like where are we uh, with the uh, with with the numbers? Um, and perhaps on on that note, we could uh, we could talk a bit about valuation. Um, you you always outline four different uh, valuation techniques uh, in your letters, and the simple average of your four valuation techniques uh, in the estimate here year end twenty twenty two has a valuation equivalent to a B share intrinsic value of four hundred and twenty one, up from four hundred and one the year before. And I wanted to talk to you about how 
uh, and what what drove the estimated increase. Uh, but then I realized that you actually summed it up <laughs> beautifully on page ninety four, and just going to to quote this uh, for the for the listeners. All in all, 2022 was a great year for Berkshire in terms of driving economic earnings power higher and deploying lots of capital intelligently across the enterprise. The media focus on Berkshire's loss report earnings for the year will probably be on the loss. Um, They'll mention will be on Berkshire's 18.1% gain in earnings power. Durable profitable growth coupled with superb capital allocation drives intrinsic value. End quote. Um, now, for those of our listeners who have not yet had a chance to read your wonderful letter, uh, could you please elaborate a bit more on that paragraph? Yeah, a lot of moving parts here. I have, I, I, I jumped through a bunch of hoops. That there are several different ways that you can value Berkshire. Some I use as reconciling tools to offset the others. Um, you look at a business on the sum of the parts basis. I also look at the company on a gap adjusted uh, earnings basis. And in terms of what I would define as economic earning power, this is, this is kind of a normalized taking out the volatility of the stock portfolio, taking out the volatility of underwriting, looking at the tax benefit of uh, using accelerated depreciation in the railroad and in the energy operation normalizing pension math, which is a charge against earnings. Berkshire, in my my work, grew their economic earning power by about $7 billion last year. Now, uh, the stock was up 4%. Book value and book value per share were down. They bought back 1.2% of the stock. But it was a, it was a year of capital allocation. I mean, the 92-year-old that sits there in Omaha is still at the top of his game. Widely criticized for maybe overstaying is welcome. You've got kooks that think that we ought to separate the chairman role from the CEO role, which they're going to do when he's gone. But, you know, the voting control rests with Mr. Buffett and he's still awfully good. He's taken himself out of direct reporting role. Greg now has all the direct reports and he's overseeing all of the non-insurance businesses. Ajit is still doing a wonderful job with the insurance operations. But if you look at what they did last year, I've actually got a table in the letter that I think would be useful to see. And it's simple, but I took simply Berkshire's cash flow from operations, simply from the cash flow statement. And I think about that number and I back off for our conversation about maintenance CapEx versus depreciation. I back off the depreciation charge, which simply says you've got operating cash flow. You have to spend so much money effectively financing your depreciation. And that's your maintenance CapEx. So Last year, you had 40 or so billion dollars in operating cash flow. You, you've got about nine and a half billion dollars in depreciations. You were left with about 30 billion dollars. Over the last five years, you've gone from 28 or 29 billion up to 30 billion. So you've, in five years cumulatively, Berkshire has, after covering depreciation, had about 150 billion dollars in operating cash flow, which is now running at a rate of about 30 billion dollars per year. That's after depreciation. That's really the allocable cash. You've got to do something with that money, right? And so we know, per the discussion about the energy business, that all of the retained profits, which is now running around $4 billion to Berkshire, but closer to $5 billion when you look through all the joint ventures, that's, that's a home for between the railroad, the energy, that, that's a home for about $5 billion. So call it 15% of the $30 billion is accounted for off the top. And that's the growth capex. And then if you look at what else Berkshire's done with capital over the last five years, well, they began a share repurchase program and now have cumulatively bought back about $65 billion worth of stock. A lot of that was done in 2000, 2021. The stock was very cheap. They didn't have much use to do anything else with capital. I think the ability to spend capex, the ability to do some things was muted by the pandemic. And so they bought the stock back. They bought it back in earnest. Uh, over this last five years, they've bought back about 11% of the company. Um, last year, the, the cadence of share repurchase is slow. They only bought back about 7.8 or $7.9 billion. What they do with the money, as we've talked about, they spent $50 billion net buying the stock. So the last five years, they've spent about per year operating cash flow and uh, have 
kind of net spent cash down, which happened last year in a big way. They went from almost $150 billion in cash down to 128. But what they spent it on? They spent it on buying stock. They bought Chevron. They bought Oxy. They put money into the stock market. Then they put money into the stock market at probably 10 or lower to earnings. And so they spent $75 billion last year against $30 billion in operating cash flow after depreciation expense. It was their biggest year on the CapEx front in a long, long time. Um, certainly way bigger than anything they've done individually in the last five years. So what'd they get? Well, they increased the earning power of the business by $7 billion. Now, I, I should pause here. When I run my gap-adjusted accounting, and I've, I've, I get pushback on this, but Berkshire has this big cash pile that's averaged about 12% of assets. To me, it's not that big relative to $950 billion. What's going to be pushing a trillion dollars in assets? I mean, if Berkshire grows this year, they're going to, for the first time, have a trillion dollars in assets on the balance sheet. There's a portion of cash that's kind of permanently held. Mr. Buffett talks about it being $30 billion. I think it's a higher number. I think they're going to keep cash on hand roughly equal to one year's worth of insurance reserves. And maybe it's even as much as that number plus the $30 billion. So maybe it's $90 billion or thereabouts. But for any cash above what I think would be permanent cash, I assume Berkshire is going to put that money to work. And they demonstrated last year a willingness to put that money to work. They're going to put it to work at more at north of 10%. But on a time value of money basis, if they don't spend it for five years, you've got a discount let's say, a 10% returning asset back to the present. And so I assume they're going to earn five. And I back off from that. Or I, I assume they're going to earn seven. And I back off from that seven, whatever the T-bill rate is, which two years ago was zero. So, you know, I was giving Berkshire 7% return on probably $60 billion of investable cash. So north of $4 billion, I would look at as opportunity cost return on cash. And so when Berkshire buys a stock or they buy a business, I don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to say all of a sudden Berkshire's earning power went up. But last year, they put so much money to work buying stocks and they spent $11.5 billion on Allegheny that on a $50 billion net purchase in stocks at a 10% earnings yield, that adds $5 billion in earning power to Berkshire's ledger. Uh, the purchase of Allegheny, I mean, was an absolute steal. We owned Allegheny. Um, Weston, Weston Hicks, who retired as CEO uh, a year and a quarter ago, is a really good friend of mine. Uh, he did a marvelous job. It doesn't get enough credit for what he built at Allegheny during his run. It's an old business. They had myriad interests in the past, but Berkshire, but uh, uh, Weston really turned it into an insurance powerhouse with their three insurance operations, TransRe and the two specialty businesses, RSUI and Cap Specialty. Berkshire paid $11.5 billion for this business. There are a lot of things they can do with it, but I think they paid five or six times earnings for it. I mean, I think they're getting a 20%, darn near a 20% earnings yield out of it. Nuances like in a $20 billion investment portfolio, Berkshire is going to have a lot more of that capital eventually invested in stocks because they can because of the surplus capital. Well, the delta there on earning 4% on bonds or earning high single digit, call it 10% on stocks, is an enormous number latent value inside of Allegheny. They had about $1.3 billion in equity capital invested in their private businesses. Allegheny Capital would be similar to Markel Ventures, uh, similar to what Berkshire's done for all these years. Well, when they bought it at year-end 21, those businesses with $1.3 billion in capital earned 12 on equity. And in the prior years, they'd earned single digits. But what you have to know is Weston had a couple of guys that were sourcing deals. They were getting paid commissions. And so as those commissions ran off, you could see the profitability run up. Well, my understanding is last year, that group probably has a billion four in capital now, and they earned 30% pre-tax ROE. Call it a 24 or 25% after-tax ROE. I had that group carried at a $3 billion valuation, probably $5 billion today, which means they bought the insurance operation for $6.5 billion dollars. And the insurance operation is a better business. You don't have to lay off risk in the retrocessional market back into the reinsurance world because of Berkshire's balance sheet. What they write, they will retain. There are just a lot of nuances. Pricing has firmed in reinsurance. So the $5 billion in premium that comes with TransRe is more profitable than it had, had it appeared for the prior two or three years. 
And Berkshire stole Allegheny. And, you know, that picks up a couple billion dollars in earning power that they paid $11.5 billion for. That's remarkable. So you get an economic return on the share. So I, it was pretty easy to get to a $7 billion increase, even offset for what's now the cash. So the cash, the uninvested cash, the, the kind of the permanent cash, which was earning zero, now it's earning five. So all of Berkshire's cash, over $100 billion is earning $5 billion. So I, there, I almost have no opportunity cost benefit for the cash because interest rates are so much higher. The delta between my 7% assumed return and the five is lower. And the portion of cash um, that's investable is down because they spent so much money last year. Thank you for, for sharing that, uh, Chris. It, it's so interesting to hear you uh, go through that uh, that deal with uh, Allegheny. And um, I, I knew when it was announced, I was thinking to myself, I wonder what Chris feels right now, like being invested in both companies. And I came up with, he's probably not too happy. <laughs> or, well, we, I, we lost it. I, I had, I had Allegheny carried it. My, my intrinsic on Allegheny was over a thousand bucks a share. Um, and they went out at 842, the $8 below 150 reflected the, the, the banking fee paid to Goldman, which was a fun story, but, um, but, but it will make more money inside of Berkshire. Allegheny's yes. assets are more yep. valuable to Berkshire than they were to Allegheny. But even had Allegheny persisted, we would have made more money out of Allegheny. And now it's a rounding error inside of Berkshire. But it's you know materially accretive to the insurance operation. It's just a very good thing. So keep your eyes on Markel, which Berkshire has been buying as well, because they could flip that. I'm not sure they necessarily want all of Markel, but... Um, Markel inside of Berkshire would be more valuable than Markel as Markel. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And 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 it is interesting that you would mention Markel with uh well just just with the with the story and, and everything that's happened. And um uh, whenever you saw that 13F filing, you were like, huh, okay, is 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 it just seemed like such a such a logic step in so many ways. But hey, who knows? Um, there are probably going to be a lot of speculation about uh, about that for the Markel branch, probably also uh, before. But Chris, I wanted to talk more about your uh, valuation techniques. Um, um, like I mentioned, you have four different that you elaborate on uh, in all your letters, um, and you also do it like more in depth in in some of your previous letters. I, sh- I should also uh, mention, and they all come with strengths and weaknesses. Um, we already discussed some of the shortcomings with the simple price to gap book value. And also uh, some methods are more conservative than others, uh, depending on the time. And you, you have this two-prong approach that understates value today. And in contrast, you also mentioned that you will hang your hat on a recent equal weighting of some of the parts basis and gap adjusted financials, uh, which suggests intrinsic value per share grew by 10.7% in 2022. Um, Perhaps you could elaborate a bit on why why are some of the valuation techniques more relevant than others depending on the circumstances? Well, we talked about price to book. And you know, even, even in there, we talked about the nuance of how the stock portfolio works. Um, to the extent any company is buying back their shares at north of book value, you're going to shrink um, equity and you're going to shrink book value per share. Uh, American Express's book value has been written down so much because they've bought back 40% of the shares. Apple's book value is diminished because they bought back so much. So those returns on equity in those businesses are massively overstated relative to what replacement cost of capital would be. We own Starbucks. Starbucks has no book value because they bought back so much stock over the last six or seven years. The two-prong approach is similarly um, nuanced by what the stock portfolio does. So w- when I say two-prong approach, I mean, Berkshire aficionados, those that have read the chairman's letter for years, if you go back to 1995, you'll know that Mr. Buffett gave you simple um, hints as to how to value the business. And he simply said, we basically have two elements of value. We have our operating earnings from everything not insurance related. And so uh, that would be all the subsidiaries, seized candy, so on and so forth. And what were those businesses earning on uh, a per share basis. And then you've got the value of the marketable securities on a per share basis. And so over all those early years, you can see the preponderance of value in the insurance operation. But again, at any at any given point when stocks were overvalued or undervalued, you'd have to make some kind of middle adjustment there. But you would simply 
capitalize the operating, the pre-tax operating earnings at some number. And we'd always capitalized them at about 13 and a half X. When the tax code changed with TCJA in 2017, here's a valuation nuance that, that some on Wall Street didn't get because they live in the world of EBITDA and above the line. If you live in the world above the interest and the depreciation and the tax line, I'm more interested in what flows to the bottom line for the benefit of the shareholder. Well, if you cut the tax rate from 35 to 21%, the shareholder earns more. And as long as that additional profit doesn't get competed away, you're going to pay a higher multiple to a pre-tax earnings number to simply represent the delta on the tax. And so we changed the multiple to closer to 15 and a half times earnings to account for what was and what has been kind of durably kept on the bottom line for the benefit of the tax code change. But, and there were nuances there. So in terms of the operating earnings, um, you'd include the, you'd include underwriting and at the outset, Berkshire included underwriting profits. And then at a point they had a period of years where underwriting lost a bunch of money and that was masking because again, insurance was so large that was masking the profitability of everything else. So they kicked that number out and said, just ignore the underwriting, just assume we underwrite break even. And then they put it back in. So we have a normalization technique in that two prong method and also in our gap adjusted financials that simply says, on what's going to be Berkshire's $80 billion this year in, in premium volume, premiums earned, they're going to earn 5% pre-tax. So in any given year, we back out whatever the underwriting result was and put in a 5% pre-tax underwriting. So last year, the underwriting across the insurers was slightly negative. They lost, I think, $90 million after tax. I'm going to give them, you know, I'm going to give them $4 billion this year in premium volume, uh, off by 80 billion in premium volume at 5%, that's 4 billion pre-tax, um, you know, three and a three, two or three, three billion on an after-tax basis. Now that's a normalization technique. So, you know, I've, I've leapt ahead and that's, that's, that's what I'm doing both at the subsidiary level and in my gap adjusted financials across the spectrum is when I make adjustments for an, in any Berkshire shareholder that follows the business will know to look at the look through earnings is when you own the stock portfolio two years ago, the end of 2021, uh, when the stock portfolio was trading at 19 times earnings, you had total earnings of about $17.5 billion on the stock portfolio. Five, a little over $5 billion of that was dividends. You had about $12 or $13 billion of that was the retained earnings. That was the, that was the earnings of Apple and Coca-Cola that don't get paid as dividends, but that are retained by those, by those businesses. And you're trying to figure out the earning power of the enterprise. You have to include the earning power of the stock market holdings. You have over $300 billion in stock market holdings. Well, given the purchases last year in the stock portfolio at low multiples to durable earning power, and given the net purchases of over $50 billion, now you've got this $309 billion stock portfolio that has no longer has earnings of 17 or 18 billion, but it has earnings of north of $23 billion. Your dividends are five and a half, but your retained earnings are now almost $18 billion. Well, that $18 billion is every bit as economical to Berkshire as the four and a half, four billion dollars that's earned by the energy business. It's but you just don't see it because it's retained by Apple and Bank of America and American Express. But it's very much a component of the earnings number. And of my 53.9, you know, 23 billion or, or, or 17 or 18 billion of that is the retained earnings. And for conservatism's sake, I'm going off on a tangent, but for conservatism's sake, of my $53.9 billion, I'm only presuming that Berkshire earns the earnings yield. So a year ago at 19 to earnings, you were you only had an earnings yield of a little over 5%. When the stock portfolio dropped going into this year, at as you mentioned, earnings yield of over seven, a little over 7%. If you only make the seven, that flows into my $53.9 billion. But if the Berkshire stock portfolio, over $300 billion of it, does 10% a year and not 7% a year, that's an additional 3% return on over $300 billion, rounded up to $10 billion pre-tax that will inure for the benefit of the Berkshire shareholder if the stock portfolio does better than the earnings yield. If you look at the history of Berkshire stock portfolio, it tends to outperform the earnings yield by three or four percent a year over time. Um, again, I'm stripping out 
short term, which now throw through the PL, any gains and losses on the stock portfolio, uh, whether they're realized or unrealized, you'd always back out the realized gains as being kind of at the discretion of management. Uh, I'm, again, I'm stripping out the volatility of underwriting, whether it's wildly profitable or, or loss, I'm running it at a 5% pre tax. Um, I'm adding the, the optionality premium for cash that we talked about, the portion of uh, intangibles that's written down that are not economic decay. I assume 90% of that decay uh, is genuine profitability, and that's a little over a billion dollars. So there are not, You can read about this in my lab, but there are a number of techniques on that gap adjusted that apply to the individual subsidiaries. Most of that amortization write down is in the manufacturing service retail group. Obviously, the underwriting changes that I make are in the insurance group. When I'm adding a billion and a half dollars um, for the use of accelerated depreciation, which says if you immediately write down 100% of an asset this year, but it has a 40-year life, you've got two sets of books. You've got the gap books and you have the tax books. When you get an immediate tax benefit, you're paying way less in current taxes than you're paying relative to the headline gap tax rate. And if those taxes aren't paid for 40 years, they're going to be paid, but you have the use of that capital because you have the tax benefit in cash terms here today. That's worth a billion and a half dollars to Berkshire. So each of the gap adjusted accounting numbers are actually done at the subsidiary level. So when I'm running some of the parts and I'm valuing the energy business and the railroad and the manufacturing service retail and finance group and the insurance group, each of those adjustments are nuanced to each of those subsidiaries, which means you should get to the same earning number at the end of the day. And that's how I get to 59 or $53.9 billion presently for both. But you can do it through simply an analysis of the railroad. You can pull Berkshire or BNSF's Q's and K's because they have publicly traded debt. You can figure out the valuation of the rail. It doesn't look that differently from a Union Pacific. And then in the energy operation, BHE and each of its subsidiaries file. And so BHE files a consolidated Q and K every year. And you can get very granular detail on what's going on at Pacific Corp and what's going on at the Kern River Pipeline and what's going on with the Dominion assets and what's going on with CoPoint. Because it's all there in the financials and it's there in the footnotes of each of these subs. And so valuing those two businesses is pretty easy because you've got a ton of data and a ton of granular. And then in the MSR finance group on the consolidated financial statements of Berkshire, that's lumped into the insurance operation. And they've got a bunch of assets and some debt that's held at the holding company level. And so you've got to tease some of that out, but it's all doable. And so you can figure out where profitability comes from. I mean, it's pretty easy to peel back some of that and now figure out where the equity is in the MSR group. Greg, in the last few years that he's been on the job, I think his hands-on approach is refreshing the management. Um, there's a lot, there's more collaboration. I think there's more focus on how we can reinvest in these businesses and the business is back to earning 10 on equity where it was earning six on equity three or four years ago. So a lot of moving parts that are valuable on a, some of the parts basis that gets reconciled through my headline gap adjusted financials, but the gap adjusted financials, anybody could do that. I mean, you could take the quarterly earnings, you could take Berkshire's annual report. And just apply these series of six or seven accounting adjustments and flip from what gets reported as gap earnings to figure out what the economic earnings are. You can also look at the press release, which shows you what operating earnings are. But I've got more accounting nuances in the work that I'm doing beyond simply the gap adjusted number that Berkshire gives you, because there are some genuine economic nuances that you've got to have a little better understanding of tax and accounting to get there. But they all they all kind of get me there to the same place. And I would discount the because the stock portfolio has been so volatile. I think the book value and I think the two prong approach are less useful today. But the other two, the, but the other two, the, my gap adjusted and my sum of the parts really is going to get you to what I think fair value is. And there are reasons why I think in in both those cases they're more conservatively stated than understated. Now, is Berkshire really going to trade at my fair value? Is it really worth nine hundred and fifty billion dollars today? Um, you know, you may just have a persistent conglomerate discount, but that's fine because to the extent the stock stays cheap and I've got cash coming in and I've got dividends and we've got cash flows and clients make deposits and I've got to save money. 
I'd rather buy my shares of anything I'm buying cheap rather than expensive. And, you know, God bless a persistent conglomerate discount or whatever you call it, because you know, I'm getting $53.9 billion of earning power for about $700 billion today. That's not bad. Not, not bad at all. And that's also what I really like about the way that you state this, that, you know, you you have to do a bit of reading yourself and, and perhaps also pull out a, a calculator uh, if you really want to to understand it. But um, pick, pick your poison. I was, I was just about to say, you can go in there and, and play around with the numbers yourself and, and follow the steps that, that you also follow. Chris, I, I really look forward to asking you this this next question, uh, and and I, I don't know if if this is going to land uh, at all, but it's especially for those uh, going to the event and for those who are like really into the whole Berkshire, um, there's this discussion, and I, I hear it year uh, and year again about using Berkshire stock to park cash. That's sort of like the headline of the discussion, and. What I wanted to sort of like throw us into here is is as much a practical but also an intellectual discussion because of course you can say it's hard to discuss the the strategy without looking at the actual valuation of of Berkshire's stock. You know, we just talked about how it was three times book value and how crazy a valuation that was, and that probably wasn't a good time to to park your cast there. But I guess what I found fascinating about the discussion is is the arguments you hear, and perhaps we can we can talk about some of those arguments and and relate it. Also to to the valuation today, of course, but it's more under the premise of can we use it to podcast, but also has the underlying premise that can I take it out again whenever I need it, whatever that means uh, for you as an individual investor. And I've I've included the the four categories of um or, or four arguments that are most often here uh, for this argument about parking uh, your cash in Berkshire. The first one is Berkshire is a different stock because it's less volatile. The second is that shareholders of Berkshire are better at valuing stocks compared to other investors, so it never becomes very cheap. Um, I also hear an argument that Buffett is the best capital allocator in the world. Um, not that I disagree with that. And, and he's not shy about putting serious money behind buying back shares when the opportunity costs are right. And then the, the last and, and, and um, argument I hear is that the stock is more thinly traded than other major stocks, and it's it doesn't require high volume before any mispricing is corrected. So uh, that's sort of like the um, that's sort of like the framework for the question. So I guess my question to you, Chris, is what is your take on retail investors' um, thoughts on parking cash in Berkshire stock, and do you think that that the question's premise should be challenged in the first place? I would challenge that premise now. When I think about my Berkshire position, we try to make it 20% of client capital. Um, it's grown in some client accounts to be a larger percentage. When you look at my 13F filing, for example, you don't see seven of my 10 internationally headquartered companies because we don't have to disclose them. You don't see any cash that various clients have laying around. Now, that cash that clients have laying around has utility for cash. If you're a foundation, and you're giving away 5% of your money, if you're gifting it to charity, you've got to have some cash on hand to make distributions. If you're sitting in December and you give that 5% away every December, you're going to give away 5% today. You're going to give away 5% a year from now. You're going to give away 5% a year from that. That's 15% going out the door in a 24-month period of time. But on a rolling basis, you're essentially giving away 5% per year. You've got to have cash. Um, I think about the Berkshire position really as a fixed income surrogate, but way better than any bond and way better than cash because of the earning power that we just talked about. That $53.9 billion in earning power is like a carrier or a battleship. It's not going to change very much. The profitability of the energy business is very predictable. The railroad has a lot of variable cost, which means it's profitability is not as impacted by the vagaries of the economic cycle. The MSR group is very diversified. The insurance operation writes seven or eight cents on the dollar of capital in the reinsurance business. Reinsurance probably has 230 or $240 billion of statutory surplus. And it writes, it's going to write 25 
billion dollars this year in premium, including the five from TransRe. So you can own a big stock portfolio there. So you know, if Berkshire earns 10 or 11 or 12 on what I look at as kind of a, 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 an estimate of what would be replacement cost of assets or even on stated book value, it's not going to deviate that much. And so you should compound at whatever Berkshire earns and then compound again at whatever rate they can reinvest money at. But it's not, it's not a cash surrogate. If you have an absolute need for cash, the last thing you should do is park your money in a long duration asset that has price risk. I mean, when we bought our Berkshire in early 2000, it had dropped by half from where it was. It went from expensive through almost three to book to 105% a book when I bought it. Um, but that's a 50% drawdown. In 1974, Berkshire was down, I think, 2.5% in 1973. In 1974, the stock was down 48 or 49% in a single year. It matched the decline of the Dow and the S&P 500. Um, Berkshire was down 30% when the S&P was down 30% in March of 2020, the pandemic. There was, there was no place to hide in the financial crisis. Uh, dropped less, but you had almost a 50% drawdown in Berkshire from 2007 to the lows in late 08, and certainly then by February of 2009. So I mean, it's it's had drawdowns that you've got to be able to stomach. And you know, if you need your money in two years or three years, the last thing you can do is put it in a long duration asset, even in a place like Berkshire. Now, for all the reasons you talk about, Berkshire is more conservatively run. You're not going to wake up and read in the Wall Street Journal that the company just committed fraud and they were hanging out with Sam Bankman Freed. Uh, but that ain't going to happen on Berkshire's watch. But, but, but when you think about cash as an asset class, I mean, here, here's another. Young investors that have kids, they want to do something great for their kids, right? So you feel like, well, I've got to save. I've got to set, set aside money. So you do your state's 529 plan. And you get you get a smorgasbord, you get a few investment options depending on the state. And so you run some mutual funds and they'll tell you kind of like, uh, you know, lifestyle funds for somebody getting closer to retirement. They'll tweak the allocation between stocks, bonds and cash. Well, that outlay isn't going to happen for 18 years when you have your baby today. And what I've seen in our own returns is if our stocks have done, let's say, 11 and a half percent a year over the last 24 years. It's been a pretty good return and the S&P has done about 6.5% a year. Uh, bonds have done about 4% a year. Cash has done about 1.5% a year. But I look at the cash that all of our clients have laying around, and I talk about this in this year's letter. The difference between what our stock portfolios have done and what our portfolios have done with the varying levels of client cash that all gets included in the numbers that we have to report. The foundation portfolio has had big cash positions, it's probably averaged 15 to 20% kind of cash. Now it's run on an, on my, my largest single account is a big foundation. It's run on a, on, a, on, on a more fully allocated basis to stocks than most foundations would be, 80 to 85% over time. And they've also owned our stocks and not the S&P. So we've been way better off earning what we've earned versus the six and a half of the S&P 500. But that cash drag across, let's say, having 15% cash across various client portfolios has harmed the return by 180 basis points. So 11 and a half, you know, draws down to 9.7. So you'd say, well, 9.7, that's still really good against an S&P or certainly against bonds and cash. Well, over 24 years, it's an enormous drag to have cash laying around for as a permanent fixture. It's the difference between growing a million dollars to $13 million and growing it to about nine and a half million dollars. That's what a 1.8% differential on the return is. It's just massively expensive. So the 529 saver, you don't get a federal tax benefit. You get a state tax benefit, Missouri at 6%. And if your options consist of fixed income funds or some level of cash, and not the stock market, and your time horizon is 18 years, you're probably going to have a subpar return. Uh, you, know, you, think about, you think about bonds as an asset class. They're, they're a horrible long-term asset class. You own a million dollars of a 30-year treasury, and you make 3.5%, you're getting $35,000 per million. Well, your long-term return is driven on the reinvestment rate, assuming you don't need the coupon 
of what do you do with that $35,000 when you get it? Well, if yields average 3.5% over the next 30 years, your total return is 3.5% and you get your million dollars back. Doesn't matter what the inflation rate has been. It is a horrible return. Cash earns typically whatever the inflation rate is. And when you've got central banks that suppress now yield, in the last 20 years, cash has earned less than the inflation rate because we've got too much federal debt and too much systemic debt. Real estate has been a way better asset class than fixed income, even at low cap rates, as we've seen in the last few years, presumably long-term, because you get your coupon and you may have a 3 or 4% cap rate, but you get your coupon, you're going to go buy more real estate. You, you know, you, if, you're, if your coupon is needed to fund the maintenance CapEx, then you're probably not making what you thought you were making on a cash flow basis. But at the end of 30 years, if your real estate has kept up with inflation, you get more than the million dollars that you plunk down on the real estate. You get, I mean, you, you made the inflation rate as a long-term owner of real estate. Stocks are a way better investment vehicle for the long-term investor. Um, you know, in our world, we've got about 20% of our profits, not even 20%, 18% of our profits coming as dividends. Berkshire skews that because they don't pay a dividend. So I was a taxable investor. I've got to pay tax on the dividends. Then I've got to reinvest at whatever the earnings yield is. But the portion of profits that are retained by our businesses, if they genuinely have places in those, in those businesses to reinvest capital at mid-teens returns on equity, that's how you make your money. You pay an earnings premium. You pay a control premium for a stock when you buy it. And that's the earnings yield. That's the inverse of the PE, right? But if you own a business for a long time, your returns are going to be driven by the economics of the business. That just makes sense. And so that's how stocks are a much better vehicle over time. Um, your, your, your capital base grows based on the retained earnings. You know, it's that, it's that retained earnings that if you can reinvest it in growth CapEx, as we've talked about, or, or, or growth R&D, our bolt-on acquisitions, the purchase of Allegheny, that's how you accrete value. If you own the S&P 500, that's even still a better investment than bonds or cash, albeit inferior to what I think we do. But you own the S&P 500, 20 times earnings, 5% earnings yield, 40% dividend payout. So you've got a 2% dividend yield, a 3% what I call retained earnings yield. And the problem with owning the S&P 500 or a broadly diversified portfolio of stocks is what happens from a governance standpoint. Public company executives get stock options and RSUs, and you tend to have about 2% dilution per year from the amount of stock that's given away to management. You then offset that dilution by buying your stock back in the market because you don't want to give your stock away and have your share count grow. So you spend 3% or thereabouts or 2.7% of your market cap per year. And in the last 20 years, we've shrunk the share count by 7 tenths of 1%, even though you're spending almost 3% of those companies. 100% of that 3% retained earnings yield, that 60% that doesn't get paid as dividends, 100% of retained earnings in the last 20 years has gone to share repurchases at 20 times earnings and a 5% earnings yield. As bad as that is, that's still better than bonds and that's still better than cash. But to your question, if you have an immediate cash need, not a cash need 18 years ago when your kid goes to college, but if you know you have to pay a tax bill because you sold your business today, and that tax bill is due next April, a year from today, today's tax date, it's a bad day. A year from today, in the, in the United States, it's a bad day. Um, you cannot afford to take risk, even in a Berkshire, because you could be sitting here with one of their 30% or 45% or 50% drawdowns. You don't know when they're coming. And if you need the cash, you better not risk it. You know, Chris, I, I love that that you put a spotlight on the 2% dilution. Um, you know, I I think a lot of investors don't know it. And, and I also think a lot of investors know it, but they're just like, you know, or, or perhaps it should should we, as you say, we to some extent, because um it's uh it's just like um it's like a pandemic, or <laughs> for like a better words of, of what you see in, in, in the corporate world. Like it's crazy how shares are being diluted and then they're like, oh, they're buying it back. Yeah, but that's, it's, it's real money <laughs> that you're buying it back with. You can't really, yeah. So sorry, I, I kind of feel I'm, I'm ranting too much, but I'm, I'm really happy it's, it's something that you, that you wanted to highlight. It's, uh, it's scary what you 
don't see unless you know what to look for. I guess that was that was my point. Yeah, and the investor needs to figure it out. I mean, if you own if you own Silicon Valley, not not the bank, but if you own if you own tech, I mean, there's there, there are certain industries that have been far more abusive of their tolerance for paying insiders uh, than others. And now you've got to expense. Twenty years ago, twenty five years ago, you didn't have to run stock option expense through the P and L, and you know the tech companies screamed and 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 protested. Um, but it's an expense. Dilution is an expense. And you either have to put it on the P and L or you have to assume I'm going to lose two or three percent of my or four or five or six percent of my company per year. The very, very real charge that is non cash, but it's very, very real. It's no different than a depreciation charge of a tangible asset. It is a very, very real expense that you better understand who you're in bed with and who's running your businesses and how willing they are to benefit themselves at the expense of you, the shareholder. Well, uh, with that said, Chris, thank you for giving me the handoff to talk about uh, Greg Abel. Uh, so uh, Greg Abel, um, he's, he's currently the vice chairman for non-insurance operations and has been buying shares in Berkshire Hathaway here recently uh, through the Abel Family's Trust. Um, so the man that many expect to be the new CEO of Dun Insurance Operations, he now, uh, and he just looked up the share price just before we hit record, $114 million uh, worth of, of A shares and, and B shares. Uh, prior to September last year, he owned very few, five A shares and 2,400 B shares. And he received some critique uh, from, from some uh, people in the, in the uh, Berkshire uh, ecosystem community, whatever you want to call it. Um, Abel received $870 million uh, before taxes for unstaking Berkshire Hathaway Energy in 2022. We briefly talked about it here uh, earlier uh, in our conversation. And he has a compensation package of $19 million-ish in base and, and bonus. So um, with an estimated net worth of a billion dollars, um, how do you as an investor look at, at Greg Abel? I should say, and and. This is poor the phrase of me because I'm I'm going to quote something long here afterwards. But there's this um, there's this thing from from the recent proxy statement. I wanted to sort of like run by you and and, and then ask you at the end of it how how that looks or, um, related to Greg Abel. Um, but to quote from the proxy statement, in particular, the go uh, the governance uh, committee looks for individuals who have very high integrity, business savvy, and owner oriented attitude, a deep genuine interest in Berkshire, and have a Significant investment in Berkshire shares uh, relative to the re resources of at least uh, three years. Um, I think I should say uh, significant investment in Berks Berkshire shares related uh, to their net worth um, for at least three years. Sorry. Uh, these are the same attributes that Warren Buffett, Berkshire's chairman and CEO, believes to be essential to be an effective member of the board of directors. End quote. So with all of that being said there, I know this is a very, very long question, uh, but uh, Chris, how do you look at uh, Greg Abel and, and, and being true to, to, to what it says in the recent uh, proxy statement? Well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of what Greg has done, um, not only of late, but when he took over Mid-American from Sokol. Um, and and he, was there, he was there previously for a long time. He came out of accounting. He's a, he's a really good manager. Um, you know, for the couple, three years that he was vice chairman in charge of all the operations and he left the Mid-American Post or he left the, the Berkshire Hathaway Energy Post. Yeah, I was always curious about his liquidity, to your point. You know, now making $19 million each, Ajit and Greg are paid identically. They don't get shares. There are no stock options. There are no RSUs. Um, Berkshire management reaches into their own pocket and buys their shares. It's unique. You don't see that at any other company outside of founders. Um, but there were a few years there where I owned more shares of Berkshire than Greg until this recent purchase. Um, so maybe I should have been CEO, but that would be a disaster. Um, but I gladly would have swapped my Berkshire position for Greg's position in BHE, of course, because of course. You know, we've discussed $870 million is real money. Now he's bought, you're right, it's position now is 114 or 115 million. Ajit owns nearly twice that shares that he's been accumulating over the years. And of late, Ajit's been giving his money to charity, um, similar to what Warren's doing, similar to what Charlie has done over time. Charlie's kind of lived on uh, a, a chunk of his Berkshire shares and uh, spent more personally than Warren spent personally on himself, but everybody at Berkshire 
all top management. I mean, they own the stock and they've never been given the stock. Um, relative to Greg's net worth, I, pr- I would guess that he'll buy more over time. I don't know what his, you know, he's got a big tax liability. He would have written a very, 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 very big check um, today, um, presumably. Uh, I don't know what he's doing in terms of charitable giving, if he's going to run, if he's going to have his own foundation. So, you know, we don't yet know uh, the degree of Berkshire on what's going to wind up being the taxable side of his ledger. You don't know what what his thinking is in terms of leaving money to his family over time. I mean, there's plenty to go around. And so that'll all get sorted out. But, you know, I would I wouldn't be surprised if Greg's position in Berkshire ultimately perhaps kind of doubles relative to current valuation and matches where Ajit is, and that would be a couple hundred million dollars, but a hundred million dollars. Who does, I mean, who does that? You know, I get excited when insiders buy 10,000 shares of a $30 stock. Um, most insiders are net sellers. I mean, they're massive net sellers. If you look at the, if you look at the table of insider buying versus insider selling, we talk about that 2% dilution. Managements don't tend to own their shares. I mean, they've got, in terms of their compensation packages, you've got to own two or three years worth of your salary as shares. And a lot of them just 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 dump the rest of it because they don't want that concentration. In Berkshire's case, you join the Berkshire board. I mean, every, every, just about every member of Berkshire's board owns a lot of the stock. There are a couple that don't own as much, but I'm not sure their personal resources are as deep as some of the other board members. But Wally just went on the board. Chris Davis went on the board. I mean, these guys have big, big, big Berkshire holdings. And for that, you know what their director's fees are? 3000 bucks a year. That's oh, it. Wow. There's no mm-hmm. DNO insurance. If, you, if, you're, if you're the lead, if you're Sue Decker, if you're the lead independent director, or you chair some of the big committees, you make $7,000 cash compensation, and you're not given any stock options. You're not given any RSUs. And so at a $19 million salary, and I'm sure that's been well thought out and there are performance hurdles that go into how these guys are compensated, but they've been there for so long. You know, that I'm sure that I'm, I'm not sure they, that they need short-term uh, incentives. The incentive is having a meaningful portion of Berkshire owned outright that you've delved in, that you've reached into your pocket to pay for. Can you imagine the culture of Berkshire changing when Warren and Charlie are gone and directors turn and CalPERS comes in, and now you're doing checkbox on ESG, and you've now separated the role of chairman and CEO, which will happen, and your directors change, and all of a sudden the culture changes, and now we're about quarterly earnings, we're meeting with Wall Street, and now we introduce, because Berkshire's never had a stock option plan, but we ought to do it broadly and widely, all of a sudden Berkshire's giving away 2% of its shares per year, $14 billion. Now, you give a stock option away at today's prices, doubles in value over the next six or seven years. You buy it at today's price. You sell it at the double. But now Berkshire's got to go out and offset the dilution. So they've got to buy back. Let's say they're buying back like the S&P 500 broadly does, 3%. So you're spending 3% of $700 billion at today's valuation. $21 billion is simply going to offset the dilution of what you just gave to the insiders. Can you imagine the uproar of the Berkshire community? Well, that's exactly what happens for the S&P 500. And it doesn't happen. So Greg's, Greg is, his incentives and his motivations are perfectly aligned with Berkshire. And you will not find another vice chairman, CEO, let's call him, in the world who has reached into his pocket in today's dollars and paid $100 million for their shares. If you're Elon at Tesla, you were given 20% of the company. You were not a founder. You were given 20% of the company in two option grants of roughly 10% each. So Elon grew to be the richest guy in the world and didn't pay a dime for that 20% position in the company other than the very low stock price. So the stock did well. So there is there is upside. Tesla, the stock had done very well when those stocks were granted. But that was a giveaway. Berkshire doesn't do it. The governance at Berkshire is different than none other. I mean, these these folks that 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 sit on the board and that run the company, they've never benefited themselves. Look at Charlie and Warren's comp package. 
I mean, they're not going to ask Greg and Ajit to go knock their pay from $19 million down to $100,000. But Warren and Charlie have been at for so long. For the history of my owning the company, I've never seen their pay package change from $100,000 per year. I mean, the, the, the employee pay, the governance calculation is a joke because the average employee at Berkshire makes more than the chairman and the, and the vice chairman, the vice chairman in this case being Charlie. So I, I'm really happy with Greg. Um, having liquidity. And again, we don't know what his personal P&L and his balance sheet and his charitable desires are, but that is a big time commitment in Berkshire. And I'd be surprised if he doesn't make ongoing big time commitments in Berkshire. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and he also added twice, uh, I should say, one a bit more than uh, than the other here recently. It will be interesting to, to see. Uh, but I, like you, I am, um, I wouldn't say at all that I've been uneasy with him not owning more. It has been Felt a bit odd, perhaps to to some at times. Also because it seemed like everyone was was looking at him, and it's it's been known for quite some time. I think even even there was like a Freud and Slip at some point in time. I can't remember which which year it was. <laughs> it was like oh, whenever Greg X Y C. I can't remember if it was Warren or Charlie who who said that, but yeah, he's the guy, right? So so you want him to to be aligned with you, and and I think you outlined it uh, perfectly. So so thank you, Chris. Um, and I should also quickly mention about Buffett. I want to say he returned fifty thousand of the uh, his uh, of, of the hundred thousand dollar compensation that he received. Um, so um, I, I think I think you're right. Whenever you talk about the governance, is it's quite well. Let's it's just <laughs> let's just say it's been been done quite well. Yeah, they've they've covered the they, they they've covered some of the travel. I mean, so you have yeah. the jet the net jets <laughs> membership now that's covered. But from a salary standpoint relative to a almost trillion dollar asset enterprise and over what's going to be $500 billion in shareholder equity. But a CEO and chairman to be making 100K is pretty remarkable. For Greg and Ajit to be making $19 million, and that's it, is pretty remarkable given the size of the franchise. Again, if you diverted their pay package to stock options, it would be way more than $19 yeah. million dollars a year, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Great point, uh, Chris. Um, before, before I let you go, uh, Chris, and, and, and thank you for, for everything that you provided the audience with here, here today. I think we all learned, learned a lot, but I also think that the audience will learn a bit more about you and, and Semper Augustus. And I, I know I said it probably five times already, but you write these wonderful, wonderful letters. Um, uh, and, uh, the price is just right for a cheap skit like me. It's, uh, it's free. You can just go into the, to the Semper Augustus website, but, uh, I wanted to, to hand it over to, to you, uh, Chris, uh, where, where can the audience learn more about you and Semper Augustus? Well, the website, SemperAugustus.com, we've got a link to an archive of a bunch of our old client letters. All of the letters from 2015 on have had somewhat of an ongoing analysis of Berkshire in addition to everything else that I try to write about each year. Uh, we've also got a link to all of our, a, a number of recent podcasts and interviews, conferences um, at which I've spoken this pod when it drops stig we'll put it on so you've got the client letters tab and you've got the podcast tab i'm also on twitter we'll see what happens there i mean i'm we'll see if twitter is even a thing by the time this podcast drops at the end of the month <laughs> uh, i'm not paying for the blue check mark and i really haven't been on twitter this year i've got i've just been busy and losing a little interest um but the handful of tweets that i've sent have have not gone as far and wide here in the last couple of weeks unless I'm paying whatever it is, eight bucks a month, you know, my Twitter audience may be greatly diminished, but I'll still have fun with Twitter and poke holes in various flawed aspects of our system. And to the extent you've got charlatans that are abusing the little guy, we'll do something with them. But I think the best place is certainly from anybody that's interested in Berkshire and investing. I think our letters are a pretty good resource. I, I definitely agree. Uh, again, uh, for the, millionth time uh make sure to read chris's letters and make sure not to just read the uh the last one but go back in the library and, and check out the uh, the others um chris thank you thank you so much for for your time and um yeah i look forward to seeing you in uh, in omaha soon two weeks we'll raise a glass it'll be good to see you wonderful wonderful that's a deal this is one of Omaha's largest events of the year. Omaha is not your typical tourist destination. So it's quite a big deal for Omaha in terms of commerce and getting people to come to the city.